now we will talk about feature selection. So, uh, you know, when we talk about dimensionality reduction, the idea is to go from a space in D dimensions to a space in K dimensions where K is, small, is, is, is much smaller than D. So, uh, and that can be helpful to, to train classifiers or supervised learning models in ways that, that will be easier because the dimensionality, the input dimensionality will be reduced. There are two main approaches for that. The, one, the first one is for is doing feature selection. So the idea is to choose K variables among the possible day variables. So we will pick directly. We say, okay, we have D variables. We choose a subset of K over this D. And this is what we use as new feature subset. Compared to feature extraction, where we will do a transformation, we will directly apply something that will transform the old data. So the, but this transformation will go from D dimensions to K dimensions. So it should be uh, in a smaller dimensionality, but possibly uh, each feature in the new that has been generated for that, the transform features will be a function of all the original uh, variables, all the original features that we add in D dimensions. The point of doing this is to fight the curse of dimensionality. You know, uh, adding a dimension uh, is exponentially increasing the mathematical space in which we are working in. So for example, in 1D, if we have 100 points uh, in the zero one interval, we, we, these points are equidistant at uh, by 0 0.01 in one dimension. If we want, so this has some kind of density, you know, we have this de sampling density over the zero one range with these 100 points. If we want to keep that sampling density in 10 dimensions, that means that we will need 10 to the power 20, which is incredibly, incredibly huge. So this amount of data is not, and label, it isn't possible to handle it well. Uh, and this will be required simply to sample a 10 dimensions space. And it goes like this for 100 dimensions, it will be incredibly uh, huge. I would say it's not possible to, to deal with that. So we need somehow with the curse of dimensionality to deal with space that are much, much more sparsely sampled. And uh, because of this exponential space that can comes with uh, many dimensions. So to deal with this, we need, uh, and so we often need to develop models and algorithms that has a high computational and high memory complexity, which is not good, which is something we usually try to avoid. So uh, this is one reason. Another reason for reducing dimen dimensionality is the fact that we want to save some measurement cost because uh, you know, we, we may need to manipulate something. We may need to measure something. If there is a human here in the loop that is doing all this measurement, or if there is some, some test that requires some compounds or some manipulation, some, some, some devices to be achieved, uh, it has a cost. So we, if we want to save the cost, we may just look for reducing the measurements and uh, make use of less measurements. Another important thing is that the simpler a model is, the less variance there is in that model. And as such, you know, if we are able to reduce the dimensionality, we are often able to reduce the complexity of the model. So we could use simpler model with a smaller dimensionality. And also it is much easier to explain with fewer variables if these variables have some sense, some physical sense or some conceptual sense. We know, and if, if we are able to reduce that to uh, five, 10 dimensions, it is much easier than to provide some explanation to analyze the machine learning model that we obtain and make sense of it in terms of interpretation. Uh, and also in terms of viewing the data, we are pretty good at looking at 2D, 3Ds, uh, visualization of data. Over 3D, it's get complicated at 4D, but I would say at 10 dimensions, it's it's really impossible to see anything and, and even more with higher dimensionality. So the capacity to view and analyze is important. An example here is the what of the curse of dimensionality is this idea, you know, we have this sampling density in, in, in one dimension. You could say it's about, I would say half sample, you know, half the space is sample, the other half, the other half is not. So we, we need 10 
10 samples, 10 positions uh, in that space to achieve this density, while in two dimensions, it means to move to 100. So we are multiplying this by 10 because we are looking at maybe 10 power one, 10 power two. And in two dimensions, to keep the same density, we may expect to require 1000 positions to obtain the same density and so on. So that's, that's difficult to manage. And we try to avoid managing that, but in fact, in practice, dealing with high dimensionality means dealing with really sparsely sample space. Um, feature selection, you know, uh, the point is to find a subset of k variables among the d variables while preserving performance. The point is to not degrade much performances. Uh, the point is, you know, uh, the number of possible subsets that we can get from that correspond to uh, pick up k variables among d. And so they are like in for, for uh, an original space in, D, in 10 dimensions, when we want to make feature subsets of five dimensions, there is 252 combination possible. This case is manageable in the sense that, you know, if we want to pick up the best subset, we may just enumerate the 252 uh, subsets, test all of them and pick up the one that is providing the best result. So this thing is manageable in that way. We can go with brute force and achieve the best uh, figure out the best subset. But for things like working with a D equal to 50 dimensions as original space and looking to get 10, uh, selecting 10 of these uh, 50 dimensions means to deal with this problem where we have 10 power 10 different subsets. And this, we cannot test everything in there. You know, that's too big. We will not be able to make use of brute force to test everything that is possible. And likewise, with picking up 20 uh, features in a space in 100D, will mean to deal with about 10 power 20, which is also impossible to deal with, even with the best computers we have now. So the point is to, is to make use of some kind of heuristics. So an heuristics is basically a method, you know, uh, it comes from the Greek, uh, and it means the art of inventing, of making discoveries. The idea is to get some kind of routines that are good to resolve a problem that is possibly not giving us the best possible solution. It is giving us a good enough solution, an approximate solution, something that is effective in terms of providing us with good results, even though it's not the best results, but that has some computational complexity that is much uh, easier, much uh, reduced compared to making use of exhaustive algorithms that will test everything. And we don't have, I would say, low complexity deterministic algorithms that may give us the best optimal, the, the optimal solution in all cases. So we are looking to, do, to make use of heuristics, algorithms that are providing in polynomial time a feasible, but not necessarily optimal solution to the problem. So this, is, this goes in opposition with exact algorithms, which, aim at, which provide guarantees that we will obtain the optimal solution for, for a given, uh, I would say, optimization, a given mathematical problem. So there are many ways to do a uh, feature selection. So uh, if we want to evaluate some subsets of features, you know, we can go through the filter approach. This means that we have some subset of features and we want to assess it. And this is important because if we are optimizing the selection of feature subsets, we want to be able to evaluate the quality of these feature subsets along the way. So making use of filter approach means that uh, we are making use of a net direct measurement like a proxy that is able to give us some measurements of quality on that subset. So they related to the performance we will obtain if we were retraining the model on that feature subset. So this is not very demanding. You know, we just have to need some proxy, some measurements that we compute directly on the processing done order on the features that we, we are selecting. The but the results may be mixed. It's far from optimal in some cases. It may give us relatively poor results in some, uh, for some cases. There is the, also the wrapper approach. So uh, this one is in fact not using a proxy or not using an indirect measurement. It is really using directly a retrained model. So we say for each candidate set, for each 
possible sets of features that we want to use, uh, we will train a new classifier and we will then evaluate its performance in terms of generalization. So we will use things like validation error or cross validation error to assess the quality of the feature subset on the classifier train with that feature subset. So uh, as you guess, it is much more expensive in calculation time compared to the filter approach. But at the same time, it is much more reliable. You know, the, the, the kind of results we are relying for evaluating the performance is, is good. It's basically what we are trying to do with that feature subset. So if we are able to pay that cost and if we figure out that we don't need to, to, to train millions of, set of, uh, of models, this can be considered as a really possible approach. Then we also have what we call the embedded approach. Uh, that means that our model is able to learn simultaneously the features. Think about things like uh, lasso, you know, the lasso in regression that we saw several weeks ago is uh, it is regularizing on the, on the L1 norm of the weights. So that means it, that it was able to disable, it was uh, possible to disable some features uh, through the learning. So that is making some kind of feature subset selection implicitly with the learning algorithm. So we may look first at making what we call univariate selection. So we are looking at the performance of individual features and select according to these performance measurements. So a basic approach is to say, okay, let's look at the variance over this, these, uh, these features and select the ones that has a variance over a given threshold. This is simple, this is, I wouldn't say naive, but that's the one way we may look at for picking up only the features, the variables that has some variance in it. So uh, the assumption here is that the variance is really accurately describing how useful is a, a variables for classification. And it is far to be uh, true. You know, it's, it may be related in some way, you know, if we have zero variance, it means that this variable is not useful, but it doesn't mean that we have a high variance that this variable will be useful. But still, you know, there's some relation and we can expect at least to filter out some really low variance vari variable, assuming that they may not be helpful in terms of the test we are looking for. So uh, it's basically good for filtering out very low uh, or zero variance cases. So, you know, for example, if we are dealing with, uh, with uh, constants or uh, yeah, measurements that is not useful at all, you know, where it's always the same measurement that is taken, so we will be able to get rid of it through this. We can, in fact, the most common approaches for univariate selection will be to select according to other criteria, like correlation between the features. So the point is that we want to pick up a set of decorrelated variables. We don't want them to be highly correlated because possibly many variables are in fact different, different, view, uh, different views on the same measurement. So possibly, uh, quite redundant and this is the kind of variables we want to remove. Another way to look at it is with what we call the minimum information between the feature and the target value. So basically we are looking at the relation between each variable individually and the label or the target value in terms of regression. And we see how related they are. And if there is a strong relation, if the mutual information is there, we want to keep that variable because you know it can be really helpful to predict the real label value. While there is no information, we can expect that it is not supposed to be helpful even though in practice, we may get some cases where an apparent no relation from one variable with the output, there's maybe something in that variable that is helpful for solving some cases or to complement other variables. So, uh, uh, so, so this, this uh, we may look at so on the effect on the empirical error. The point is to say, okay, let's just mask one variable. Let's just remove it, or let's uh, assign it like some imputation values to replace the current value and see the effect on the empirical error. And if we see that when we are replacing systematically some variable with some other ones uh, by imputation. If it degrades significantly the empirical error, it means that this variable is useful. While it, when we see there is no impact, if we just replace every time that variable by a zero by its mean value, if the, the results are not changing, then uh, it may mean that this variable is not useful. 
one approach for uh, building up a feature set also is what we call the forward sequential selection. So this is, I would say, more advanced than univariate selection. Univariate selection is really looking at each variate independently one at a time. And basically, once we went through all the variables, that's it. Forward sequential selection is, in fact, gradually building the feature set. So we will be sure that we are not losing some relation between one variable and the others that may be useful for doing the task. Because uh, the point is to start with an empty feature set. So we say, okay, let's, let's first start with nothing and then add the feature that improved the most according to some criteria like accuracy, classification rate, the set of features. So we know if we add this feature to the current set of feature, we will improve or we will achieve the best performance. And we will repeat the step two as long as the stop criterion is not reached. So basically we will add features one at a time. And at every step, we'll just say, okay, over all the features I have right now, which, is, which feature is the most useful for improving my empirical accuracy from the point or for reducing my empirical error. And so we repeat this until the stop criterion is not reached. So this is a greedy algorithm, you know, it makes interactive local decisions. So it does not take into account complex relationship between the variables. So if we have, for example, three variables like X, A, X, B, X, C that are taken individually as not very useful, the gain is low. But if we put them together, we may get a high gain. So with the feature sequential selection, we are, we are relatively blind. We are greedy in the sense that we are looking only at the immediate uh, good decision. So it is myopic, it is local. Uh, we are looking at the interaction of the current variables and the next that are variables. So what will be the next variable to add that will give us the best improvement? So with the three-way relation, like I'm saying here, uh, we, may, we may miss this three-way relationship between the variables. Although it is not that common, I would say, you can expect that uh, the, 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 the relation of, new, of each variable with the current feature set so may be a capture a lot of things. The algorithmic complexity of forward sequential decision is big O K D. So it means that we go over all uh, dimensions for key steps. So we want to build a feature set of key dimension, key variables. So we need at every step to look over all the current, uh, the, 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 the original variables that are, avail that, are, that are available or usable for that. So more formally speaking, the forward sequential selection algorithm looks like this. So we are first initializing the algorithm with an empty feature set. Then we are creating the set of unselected features. So basically every features at first are not selected. Then we are looping from one to D as long as the stop criterion is not reached. So we can go up to D if we wish and then backtrack to the best uh, feature set. Or we can just stop when we reach some, some values or some ma maximum uh, feature, sets, feature subset size. So at first we are looking at the feature that is reducing the most the error. So basically we are computing the error on the using, I would say the, the current feature set plus one of these unselected feature and see the performance in terms of error. And, and we are picking up the variables that when added is, is uh, reducing the error the most. But that may mean that when we add that feature, uh, yeah, actually, we, we are expecting that the error will be reducing by adding the features. And so once we went through all available unselected features, we will pick up the one that is the best. We will add it to the feature subset and we will remove it the, of the unselected set of features, so the set of unselected features. And then we return the final subset F as the set of selected features. With this, you know, there are some different possible criteria, stopping criteria. We can stop when key features are selected. So basically we say we want to go up to K and we will stop at when we reach K features, that's the simplest one. We can go up to the end or when we just may uh, stop when all features are selected and then we will backtrack. We will return back to the set of features that was leading to the minimum empirical error possibly on the validation set. Uh, we can stop also when the error reduction is below a threshold. You know, when we see that the gains are pretty small, we don't add anything much with the new features. 
possibly this is a good indication of stopping there because there is no gain. We can also apply a reverse approach that we call the backward sequential selection. The idea is to start with all variables and iteratively remove those that contribute the least. So we want to remove the least useful variables one at a time. This means to start with the full feature set. So we get the D features here as the initial feature set. And we loop forward, backward. I mean, we start from the, the end and we just kind of move, loop from D minus one up to one as long as the stop criterion is not reached. And then we are looking at the, the, the least contributing feature, the feature that when removed seems to have the less impact on the error, seems to be possibly when we remove it, we are not even, uh, the, the error is not even increasing. So uh, over all possible features, we look at the effect of the feature set minus the possible features to, to select. So we will remove, once it is selected, we remove that from the, the, the feature subset and we continue. And then in the end, once we reach just a criterion, we remove the, feature, the subset F of selected features. That was the most interesting. There are some other approaches for feature selection like the L, add L remove R model, which is a hybrid between forward and backward sequential approaches. It avoids some local minima because sometimes maybe one variable that is added at the, at the beginning, which may be very really useful in terms of improving the results at that point, may be redundant with many other variables that we will we'll add along the way. So possibly in that case, we want to backtrack and possibly stay after adding L features. We may want to remove R of them to be sure that we don't keep things that are no more useful given that you know, the decision was made quite early and now later on in the process, these variables will not be useful. So, so this hybrid is, is kind of interesting. Another approach may be is branch and bound. So the idea here is to organize features into trees according to their similarities. So the point with, is to move in that tree and to cut some points to eliminate similar features. So the idea is to, is to remove everything remove those that are redundant or related or similar to the ones that are currently picked. So this is a relatively organized way for doing this. And we can also make use of multi-objective evolutionary algorithm. So this population-based optimization approaches, which are inspired by natural evolution. So basically Darwinian principle is applied on, on a population of potential solution. It is a really bigger, is what we call a meta heuristic. So this is really a, a heuristic that is applicable in many, many situations. Uh, the approach here would be to say one individual is a subset of feature, and we want them to optimize, to evolve this population of subset of features by optimizing according to two objectives, that is reducing the error and reducing the number of selected features. So. Evolutionary algorithms is particularly interesting for multi-objective optimization. This is a, a, a situation where these meta are working quite well. 